My name is Atalta. I'm going to present behavioral biometrics, a new form of identity verification. This is something that I have been doing research on since last six, seven years. So it would be nice to see how these behavioral bi biometrics are developed, why there is a need, for example, how to evaluate them and how they are different from existing approaches. OK. So just uh, if I summarize the outline, we will say how we are identified. We will start with, for example, even in daily lives, how we are identified. She is Barbara, I am Guriro, he is Dia. We, we just look at each other, you know, by the face, we identify each other, right? By walking style, we identify each other. By voice, by listening to someone, we identify themselves, uh, identify them. So this is how we are identified, right? Why biometrics? I will talk about this. Why biometrics, you know? Why is it important? And why should we use biometrics for our applications? And then the question, why behavioral biometrics? I will talk some limitations of this biometrics, and then I will propose behavioral biometrics and some behavioral biometric based solutions that we have developed. For example, I will talk about them. And uh, I will talk about behavioral biometrics for next generation devices. The next generation devices means smart, smart devices to me. Smart watches, smartphones, tablets, for example. And some innovative solutions. Sorry, I said this innovative, but because they are my solutions, I should not have said this innovative solutions. If you want, for example, I will do some hands-on exercises as well, just to be sure that we are on the same page, you know, how to uh, develop a behavioral biometric solution, for example, for something. And then we will end with, with just summary and the future work. So motivation. The question that I asked you earlier, who doesn't own smart device? All of you have smart devices, right? These smart devices, for example, could be smart watch, could be smartphone, could be uh, could be tablet. Okay. So if you, you own these smart devices, you are among the 61% of the entire population who owns this device. So these devices are very popular. These devices are very personal. They, these devices provide you anytime, anywhere computing. You know, that's why they are extremely popular and they are used everywhere. And it's a, it's a study that says by 2025, 72% of all the internet users eh, will solely use smart devices to access the web. So laptops or, you know, desktops, they would not be used, at least as per this study, for this uh, internet accessing. These internet resources will be accessed using smart devices. OK. Now, let's start with tablets. How many of you own tablets? Yes, fine, five, six people. OK. What, are, what do you use it for? What do you use your tablet for? Browsing internet. Browsing internet, very good. Mm. Making movies. Watching movies? Yes. No. Studying papers? Yes, yes. 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 studying papers. Working hours. Reading lots of papers. Giving lectures. That is a very I good application. So, <laughs> actually, these templates are used for a variety of applications, like teaching as well. So, for playing games, it depends on the age, it depends on the users. Okay. So, some for me, like for example, I used to play games, I used to read papers, I used to watch movies while, especially while traveling to Trento or Trento. Uh, <laughs> by car? And by train, of course, by <laughs> <my> car. <laughs> <laughs> we have seen security problems. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm among these users. 84% of the users, they use tablets to play games. Just some, some statistics. And searching for information, like Yanni said, 78% they used to their tablet to actually search on the internet. So you see, tablets are very, very popular. Okay, and they could be used for anything, 
right? From shopping online to reading books, consuming entertainment, doing online shopping, uh, talking to your friends, uh, family members, making videos, audios, everything. So they are extremely popular. This is something that we are agreed on. Now, then comes uh, smartphones. This, this, this tiny device, for example. This, this is called smartphone. And they are also very, very popular. Why are they popular? Because they provide anytime, anywhere computing. You have mobile connectivity. You could do whatever you want to do with a laptop or with a computing device. And the powerful processors these days, you know, they, are, they have powerful processors, long lasting batteries, and the GPS, Wi Fi, all these features, they make them very special device for us. So imagine if you have to spend a day without mobile. I would not be looking, you know, it would be difficult. So here there is a point. The point is we use this device. We use this device in shorter, longer and frequent sessions. This is point that I want you to remember. Unlike computers, for example, when we enter password, we do like at one hour, one hour, 30 minutes, two hours. Normally, these sessions are very long. No, normally. And then at the end, we we just lock out and we just go around and you know, take some break. But here on the phone, this phone needs to be accessed in, in frequent, shorter, and a longer sessions, right? All three. Now, <laughs> I study shows that this phone, for example, we access it uh, every 6.5 minutes. So 150 times a day, we, we access our phone. And imagine entering password 150 times. Commerce. Now, the result is, what, what are the consequences of this? Because we have to use all this information, we have to protect everything. This global smartphone users, they are increased by approximately 50% in this period of five years. So people, they, they, they are actually buying, they are coming, you know, to, to, to use these smartphones. And UK is now a smartphone society. Smartphones are very popular in teenagers, actually. So these teenagers, these people, they actually use smartphone as the only computing device. And computer usage falls as 20% of the mobile phones, they go mobile only. So this shows that this, these devices, they are extremely popular and among every age group, not necessarily in the teens, but every age group, they are extremely popular. And smartwatches, okay. So these smartwatches, we are, now we, we don't just use them, for example, to, to stay in touch or receive notifications, for example. They are used for plenty of applications, plenty of things. Notifications, you know, we, 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 we receive notifications. You see, you have a group meeting and sometimes you do this navigation and you do everything you want to, for example. Some advanced users, for example, they use these watches to control their, for example, to control their devices, to control their, to control access to their, uh, to their devices and to control access even to the secure infrastructure as well. Fitness, answering calls, and also like I have added here social etiquette because if you are in a meeting, if I'm in front of you, and, I, and I, if I see this phone, for example, it would be a bit rude, you know, to see my phone in front of you, rather than doing this. The purpose is the same, okay? So smartwatches, you know, they are also very, very popular. And all of these devices, they are very, very personal. When I say very, very personal means Nobody would like to share these devices with anyone, anyone who he doesn't trust. So what are these devices used for? Okay, beyond classical communication, the purpose of these devices were just, for example, to, to, to receive calls, to receive messages, to place a call, to talk to someone. This was the classical, you know, cause of these devices, the use of these devices, but now, they are being used to take videos, to take make movies, for example, or take pictures. We do we use these devices for social networking. Like we use it 
uh, for Facebook, you know, to access Viber, to have, you know, LinkedIn, WhatsApp, Skype, Twitter, everything is there on our smart devices, on tablets, on phones, on watches. Significant fraction also does online transactions using these devices. Okay, transactions like Google Wallet, for example. This one, you see, you, need, you can pay with your watch, for example. No need to take with you additional, uh, you know, your uh, purse, for example, to pay. Or oh, these smart devices, this is the negative point that I want you to focus on. These devices, you know, they continuously track the user's locations. So you don't need any additional spyware, for example, here, no? So they are continuously looking at your location, continuously looking what you have been doing, for example. So they have full control over users' sensitive data, right? And all of these apps generate and store very personal information. It stores, it generates, you know, you enter your PIN, you enter your password, you enter your code, for example, that code needs to be saved. So all of your sensitive data is stored, is generated and stored on that particular device, right? The point is, this data needs to be protected. How? How should we protect this data? First line of defense is authentication, then encryption. Okay, additionally, additionally, this is also another scenario, for example. Users use these devices, for example, to talk to their IoT controller, for example. If you consider a scenario of smart home, for example, okay, you want to execute a command. Turn on this button, turn on this air conditioner, for example, using this, right? Or open the garage door for me, right? So these devices are also seen as a medium between you know, communicating with the real device to, to execute the command. I will, uh, here I will simulate a scenario of this building we will discuss. Then another thing is, like I said, for example, they are not just used now for, uh, for, uh, for example, for classical communication. They are also used to, to access cars. Now this smart Apple, for example, watch is used as a master Master, uh, master key, for example, to access your car. So this data that is on your phone, on your watch, for example, this needs to be secured. This needs to be accessed, right? Any question till now? Okay. So here comes the topic, user authentication. I said user authentication is the first line of defense. So the, if there is a strong mechanism implemented here, you will not be able to see the content inside this phone, right? It should give you like three attempts, for example, to, to enter your secret, and ten, three attempts, for example, if you are not providing any secret correctly, what will happen? Your access will be denied, right? So user authentication is the process of verifying the identity of the person. If I'm claiming I'm Guriro, the system should identify me this system should verify my identity. How this verification is performed, we will see. So being able to prove a user is who he or he claims to be, is, is authentication. Now, I told you, password was created, you know, this mechanism was created in 1964. By that time, there were no smartphones, there were no smart watches, there were no smart devices. So it took, mainly the system was built only for laptops, for desktops, for computers, no? So for computers, as I told, in computers, you, you don't use this computer frequently, okay? You, you, or, or for short sessions, you use it for longer sessions, you know, two hours, three hours, and then you log out. So for their password is okay, but on phone, it's problem. Now, protecting long-term sessions, this was the main core of developing these solutions. One shot, talk to problem. The decision is boundary, one shot. I mean, either you are accepted or you are rejected. This is the outcome of entering password. If you enter your password correctly, you are authenticated. If you didn't manage to enter correct password, you are denied the access, right? So this outcome is binary. Now, now these days, for example, with these all these devices, what is required now? The requirement is 
you know, long, short, and frequent session. Users are our friends. If they are using 150 times their phones, you know, we should have some simple solution that help them, no? In, instead of adding like uh, passwords every time they need to access the phone. So this is one thing, repeatable, as and when required. So when I say as and when required means this system should be continuous. It should be continuously authenticating me. I'm in the hands of Buriro. I'm in the, in the pocket of Buriro. No need to authenticate him. When it doubts, it should authenticate. It should ask for my secret, for example, or anything. Risk-based and adoptive. This is the need of the day, you know? So, and continuous. Now, authentication mechanisms. There are three mechanisms. One mechanism is password, which we call knowledge-based. Okay, password, entry pin, password, graphical password, for example. They are knowledge-based schemes. Then we have possession-based. Smart card, that card you use to access this building, for example. This token, I call it token, this one, sorry. Okay, so, and characteristics based, physical, behavioral. Gate recognition is behavioral biometrics. Face recognition is uh, physical biometrics. Okay, iris recognition, physical biometrics. So here you see, for example, these are all physical biometric, types of physical biometrics. Fingerprint, hand, iris, this is Calera. This face complete features, DNA, you know, all these are physical biometrics. And behavioral biometrics, keystroke, anyone knows about keystrokes? Because you implemented this. Anyone else? Keystrokes. The power they are pressing on the and the keys you can identify close you. close very close the time between shifting from the key. perfect perfect this key strokes means the time based on the timing differences you press the key and you release that key the difference between those periods pressing and releasing and pressing and releasing another key releasing and releasing another key these you know timings could be used as a invisible layer you know for keystroke dynamics so this keystroke dynamics is already there. Signature recognition is a very, very popular biometric modality. It's a behavioral modality. Have you signed your contract? You signed it, right? So the signing is an acceptable way of, you know, acceptable modality to everyone. So people use this modality also. Voice, even if we have, uh, like we meet some, someone 10 years later, for example, we will identify him from his voice, for example. It's also a behavioral modality. Now, why? How many of you have passwords on your phones? How many? Five, five. And biometrics? More. More users have biometrics. I will go with the flow. So you see, biometrics is a preferred choice. Because from the, for the knowledge-based mechanisms, for example, these passwords could be lost. I told you, an average IT person has to remember 31 passwords. It's very, very difficult to remember passwords, right? So they could be lost. They could be stolen. And because this attack space is very small, for example, you are required to enter four digit or six digit password. How many different combinations could be to launch a brute force attack, for example? For four digit pin, it, it should be 10, 10 to the power four. So just nine, 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 10,000 so different combinations, no? Matter of seconds. So that's why people that don't use these passwords anymore. This one, graphical passwords, or these, these tokens, for example, keys, these, uh, your tokens, your cards, for example, they could be cracked, they could be forgotten, they could be stolen, you know? You, if you remember these 9-11 uh, attacks, two of the attackers, they were using 
at least two stolen passports of Saudi Arabia. So these tokens, they can be stolen. And I don't think it could be theft. Then that's why biometrics are preferred because they are unique. You are not required to bring them explicitly. They are with you. They are part of your body. No, they cannot be stolen. They cannot be forgotten. They cannot be shared. So they provide you more security as compared to these passwords, pins, token based authentication mechanisms. So biometrics is the need of the day. Now, anyone knows about biometrics, how this biometric system works? Biometrics. No? Yes, Yannis. Yeah, these are the modalities. You provide the fingerprint. This data from this fingerprint is extracted in the form of features. Then these features are saved somewhere in the database. And then this database, these features from this database are used to train the classifiers. And then this classifier, trained classifier is implemented in real time, right? Then test set comes in and it, it is tested against that trained classifier. Very good. So because most of you don't know how biometrics works, I will just very quickly give you a brief overview of it. So the use of physical or behavioral characteristics for example, for human beings for automatic identity recreation. So you see here recognition, face, fingerprint, iris, palm print, gait. This, is, this one is behavioral. Voice behavioral, signature behavioral, ear, size of the ear. Okay. This DNA, this palm veins, even these veins could be used to identify people. Hand geometry, you know, sclera, pericular, keystrokes, fingerprints. There are a lot. There are a lot. Okay, so you can develop any biometric system using any of the modality. But before implementing or before developing the solution, make sure that you choose the best modality. Now, here, for example, consider this as a biometric system. Here, which sensors should be used here? Come here. Yeah, camera. Yeah, thank you. So you could use camera because it's a face recognition system. So here you took the image, took the picture of a person, processed it, extracted the features, and these features are saved as templates somewhere in the database. And here is the classifier trained on those features, and then it identifies you whether it was you or someone else. Okay. So this sensor is very important. It varies across different uh, different modalities. A detailed biometric system, for example, works this way. So you are here. Here you have mic. You have whatever sensor you are using. If you are using mic, uh, voice biometrics, you will be using microphone, for example. Or here, mic, for example. Then you have here. You collected the signals. You extracted this. The data is in the raw format, right? So you pre-process it, you extracted the features, and this picture vector is stored in this database. So you have created template out of that data. Now, there are two parts of this uh, biometric systems. One part is called enrollment. Another part is called verification. In the enrollment part, we say, for example, you, you know sign up process. You whenever you are you want to access a service for example you first sign up you provide your details right and then you test so this this enrollment is called a sign up for example so you must provide these data for example more evidences more data to 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 perform this enrollment and then for the testing it will be done with just one attempt at least or with any number of attempts an attacker also could apply, you know, could attack also this system. We will see how. Now, enrollment. In enrollment, it is controlled. It is supervised. So, for example, have you ever been to Kastura? Okay. So, for, for applying your permission of the sojourn, for example, what are you asked for? 10 fingerprints, right? 
also the <laughs> clapping as well. <laughs> These as well. Uh, this palm. And, palm. Uh, okay, I'm going to suggest this, them this clapping as well. But okay, this palm is also <laughs> this palm is also collected. Now the point is, you see, if you have been there, you will notice that a lady, for example, sit, sitting next to you, actually sometimes say no, put correctly. Sometimes she touches your finger and rolls your finger like this on the sensor. Number one, supervised. Control. This enrollment is very, very important. It should be controlled. It should be supervised and as many samples as possible because you have most of the most of us have 10, so they collect 10 samples. <laughs> right? <laughs> now, multiple measurements. And they say of, of, of you know, while collecting, she also looks at the quality of the data. No, this part is missing. No, we need to do it again. It is also possible, right? So quality control check is performed as well. And selection of the best sample or merging of the best sample also happens. Now, for same way, the features are extracted. So you have 10 samples. You have provided 10 samples. Also, palm print samples, they are saved some. While in testing, for example, oh, just uh, 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 yeah, this one, for example, this project is very famous project in biometric community. It requires a lot of time as well. Enrollment. It requires some time, right? F because for fingerprint, you know, you may take like 10 minutes. But if she asks you, okay, you have to sing this song as well. <laughs> because I need to save this voice script somewhere as well, right? So this way, for example, based on the quality, based on the biometric modality, the time can vary. So for example, this uh, Aadhaar project in India, they probably have already enrolled around very close to a billion users now. And this card, they have, they, then they have included all this information in a card, they call it Aadhaar card. And this, they, they distribute, you know, ration, they distribute every facility based on that card. So they collect everything, the images, iris, for example, 10 fingerprints, palms, everything. And this this data is translated to the chip and the chip is part of it. Verification, you know, because you are not supposed to use, uh, you know, this phone, you, can, you are supposed to use this phone anywhere you want to, right? So this now providing a sample, for example, will be identity verification. So if I need to unlock my phone now, what, what will I do? I need to enter one, two, three, four or password or whatever. And then it matches me and grants me access if this password is correct. So this is testing, this is verification, you know, it has to do. This verification is normally not supervised unless this verification is performed at airports. <laughs> okay. And reading of the biometric template. Most of the time, this testing is a single, single test, single, providing just one time your sample. Process is the same, then this, is, this data is matched. Which data is matched? The data that you have extracted, for example, okay? Now, just giving you an example, matching and decision making, how this data is matched. So you see here, these are, for example, finger, uh, query fingerprint, this is, and these are the extracted features, mini sharp points, these are called these billion dots, you see? And here, in the database, Kostura received your finger, for example, this image, it is already in the database. Now this, they measure, when you provide this sample, they measure the difference between these two mini sharp points. Okay, so if this uh, difference is more, for example, it means they are less similar. So if this distance is small, it means they are more similar. So simi based on the similarity or based on the difference, uh, these are identified. Okay, this identity is verified or identity is confirmed. So here the theory is, main requirement is, we need this decision making to be very quick. It should not take longer, for example. Consider giving, let's say, I say on your phone, enter 16 digit password, which doesn't contain, which should contain, you know, alphabets, uh, underscores, uh, uh, numerics, uh, characters. Okay, 16 digit long. So you will need to enter 16 digit, it will be difficult. Biometric systems, 
they are evaluated in, in, in the form of false match or false non-match, false accept rate or false reject rate, or we say equal error rate. So false match means an imposter sample matched incorrectly. Okay, this is called false match. False non-match means a genuine sample didn't match the reference template. So I am the genuine user of this phone and my sample was mistakenly misclassified. Okay, then you have a cool error rate. So these two errors, they are very important for sometimes for usability increasing, for example, for increasing the usability, we don't care this. Sorry, this, we care this. So for example, if I develop a system and it, it is 70% accurate, what does it mean? If it authenticates you like four times out of five, okay, one out of five attempt gets rejected, means 80% times you are truly accepted, right? And when another person tries in, if he says, for example, uh, if, if he tests and he, uh, among the five attempts he made, if he is tested positive all the times, what will happen? So you will say, I have higher false acceptance rate, right? But for usability, for example, we can say, we will make the system more usable in a way that it will never reject you. Okay, but we are not saying it will never accept anyone else. You got my point. So this, uh, based on this, uh, some companies, uh, they also suggest using this EER, equal error rate. So they say there should be a trade-off that is also, that exists, the security and usability trade-off. And this should be, you know, uniform based on this equal error rate. So sometimes they said it should be equal. Now, also like for graphical representations, for example, we report these results in terms of ROC curves. Anyone knows ROC curves? Receiver operating characteristics curves. They exist in image processing, they exist in computer vision, they exist in everything, everywhere. So you, you yes, you plot, these errors between false accept rate and true accept rate of a system. Okay, and based on different thresholds, you compute this, these curves. So the curves closer to this coordinate is very, very accurate. The curve lower than this coordinate, for example, here is less accurate. Okay, so this is ROC curves. There also exist DET curves. We will see. Now, can anyone tell what is the problem with the existing authentication approaches? Yeah. How many times you would be happily entering your password on your phone? Zero? <laughs> Zero. <laughs> but you will still have your password, right? <laughs> I forget. <laughs> exactly. This was. This is my claim. You forget your passwords. So the point is, they are difficult to remember. I mean, this is a problem to to the usability. And they are non transparent. Means every time I need to unlock my phone, I need to enter pin. So they require extra effort. Okay, me for me to 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 enter my password. So this is against the usability. Shared, forgotten. This poses a security threat. Passwords could be shared, could be forgotten, like I already said. Attack vulnerability. You know, I said there are there are not like, uh, if you are using four digit pin or six digit pin, you know, the, the combinations are not many. So it will be a matter of minute to apply a brute force attack. Now, Yanis, don't say you are using one, two, three, four as your password. Yes. Congratulations. If not, you are not among the 10% population who uses out of 3.4 billion passwords database. You are not among them. Very good. Congratulations. And 6% of them, they use 1111 as password. So you see, you know, 47, 1212, 3, 4 zeros, these are the passwords that we use. And for example, graphical passwords like this. It's very simple. Sometimes M, sometimes N, because we have, we do not have, uh, you know, a wider 
option available. We have only limited option. Now, uh, apart from this, you know, there is also another point that I want to make. When you are interacting with your device, you always leave your smudges on your devices. Touching tablet or touching, for example, your uh, phone or entering your pin, you leave your nudges, uh, smudges, and those smudges could be learned, could be learned like this, for example. So this is also a, a problem. Now consider, for example, if these problems, they exist for smartphones, how about using them on smartwatches? <laughs> it's even more difficult, no? So smartwatches also we have to accommodate somehow. So this is study, this study says, users consider these passwords, graphical passwords, as annoying and don't use them. 70% of the population, they don't use passwords anymore because they don't, don't trust their passwords anymore. Right? Now, physical biometrics, if you are working in physical biometrics like fingerprint, face, you would be a fan of this, right? You would say these are the most secure biometric modalities ever researched, no? But it's fine, but the application is different, the scenario is different. We are using them on phones, on smartwatches. They are also non-transparent. You need to, whenever you need to unlock your phone, you need to provide your fingerprint and it's unlocked, right? So every time you need to access means transparency is not there, non-transparent. And environmental effects, they also pose some usability. Like for example, using face recognition in dark, in the evening for example, would not be that accurate as compared to now. Okay, so environmental conditions also and attack vulnerability as well like fingerprint for example is considered the most secure biometric modality ever but this lab from germany is called chaos lab they are continuously hacking apple touch device on the second day of their release <laughs> and the point is apple doesn't learn from these things so the point is also, apart from this, these are time consuming. Physical biometrics already there, already exist. These two, for example, here there is a fingerprint sensor, here this watch uses face, face technology. This one is Fujisto's device, they use iris recognition, for example. And here this watch also uses iris recognition technology. So the material is there, but the point is, you, you take 15 to 20 seconds of your time on this device, even. So because you have to bring your phone in front of you so that, you know, the, the, the circles are filled with your eyes and then they, they catch your sample and, you know, perform this authentication. 15 to 20 seconds. Would you be willing to use this system? 15 to 20 seconds, come on, it's a lot of time. And also like now consider using this technology, iris recognition on this watch. It would be difficult, no? So these problems, eh, apart from those problems, there exist also other problems. <laughs> Sabari, who is he? Is it Barack Obama or Osama Bin Laden? No, Barack Obama. Osama Bin Laden? No, it's Barack Obama. You see? <laughs> so the point is, you know, because physical biometrics also, we use, for example, social sites. We leak our data on the internet. Okay, if I search your name, I will find the image of Dia somewhere, right? So the point is, it's very easy to launch an attack, a replay attack, for example. So here, for example, in order to access your computer, you, you need to print an image and show to your computer and your grant, your, you will be granted the access. The point is, it's not now, it's not very difficult to spoof these systems. It's very, very easy. And people are doing this. So, this, all these problems, they actually motivate for better solutions. Have you heard of this story, for example? A researcher, for example, extracted fingerprint from, from an image of Trump. So Trump did this, this guy took the image of his fingerprint and he extracted the, 
the, the fingerprint of this. It's possible. So yes, sometimes it was believed that this, this modality is very, very secure. But now, trust me, five out of four out of five users, they are hackable. This is a very strong statement, but from the smartphone, smartwatch scenario, it's it's doable. So, but it's a, not a, not a foolproof solution anymore. Also, in addition to all these phones and everything, in order to access your building or access this room, for example, we are supposed to remember pins one, two, three, four. If you want to access a secure infrastructure. OK, so this could be the solutions, digital keybed. They are already there in the market. And also like fingerprint, also, you know, this card that you showed me, and also this pairing, device pairing mechanisms. They are already, they already exist. But as I showed you, there are a lot of problems, you know, for these systems. So I will address also this uh, scenario as well in my research. Now, we have, I think we are, we are now able to make some conclusions, right? So hey, conclusion is passwords, pins, and physical biometrics. Actually, they do not fit the current interaction model. Okay, for this new landscape. Are you agree? No? no. Why? I think it depends on the context. I'm so, talking about smartphones and smartwatches and smart devices only. I'm not yeah. Talking, yeah. Like even like for instance, you talked about say for instance when you're using your smartwatch, it doesn't make sense for you to do like this. Exactly. exactly. But like I could even be talking to you and unlock my phone like this with my tongue print and it's still essentially what I, I can I can basically look at you and be recording or do something. Very good. Very good. So that's what I'm saying Okay. okay. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. I accept this. But in larger <laughs> context, for example, they, I'm talking about smartphones, I'm talking about smart devices, tablets, even for example, uh, there is a need for new acceptable and secure metaphors. My point is all these mechanisms, they are developed based on security. They are security driven systems. Yeah. No one cared about usability. This is my you know, so user is also your friend, is not a foe, no? So if the system is usable, if a secure, a security is acceptable, I think it should be better, right? So then as I'm saying, newer, acceptable and secure that are usable, they are required. Design should depend on usability, security, and bring your own device principle. You, everyone brings his phone or his uh, watch, for example. So why, why shouldn't we use that resource to authenticate? In security, humans are considered as the weaker link. Anyone who is disagreed with this. Are you agree that humans are considered as the weakest link in cybersecurity, right? So, but the twist here is, for example, what is unique about a person we use to enhance that security? We are using that particular uniqueness to enhance. So the goal is to design lightweight, user-friendly, and secure authentication and access control mechanisms. This is the need of the day. Now, what is behavior? Sleeping is also a behavior. <laughs> there, is, there is a wide range of actions everyone does. For example, this walking is style. This is behavior. My, my, my talking is tight, is a behavior, voice recognition, for example. So unique strategies, different skills, and different strategies when you apply to do something, okay, they are called behaviors. And these behaviors, mind you, they are not new. They exist somehow in other studies, psychology, for example, in other studies as well. But in this authentication scenario, on this in this authentication domain, they don't. So the advantage they provide, for example, consider if you have voice recognition, okay? You, you don't need any sensor, no, any extra device, like fingerprint scanner, for example, right? Yeah. 
So it means data could be collected unobtrusively, right? And no need of additional hardware and uh, arguably very secure. Why I'm saying arguably? Because they are not researched at the moment up, up to the extent they need to be. So it's difficult to draw a conclusion at the moment. Challenges, yes. Can you go back? Sure, sure. So before you said that, uh, for instance, you could log in, uh, grant access to a computer with a picture of the face. Yeah. Uh, why can't we just reproduce uh, some uh, voice notes of, of somebody to log in with this voice uh, or record uh, this person walking and show the video to a camera? Exactly, exactly. This, this is the threat to, to, to behavioral biometrics. Okay. This is right, yeah. The same replay attack, yes, it could happen. Okay. Yeah. So the challenge is, first of all, this behavior needs to be unique. The challenge is, you know, when you identify a gesture, for example, I identified this gesture. This is called snapping. So this snapping, for example, is unique from person to person. If you plot, so there exist two types of variations. One is called intra-class variations. The samples, the variation in my samples only, for example, just to give you an example of this lady. So this is intra-class variations. Same person, but different poses, different, uh, you know. So this is called intra-class variation. For inter-class variations means the differences between you and me, between your samples and my samples. So uh, idea was the challenge is identification of a suitable biometric modality that is unique, that is stable, that is secure and whose performance is good. So we identified these two behaviors. One, for example, the touch, so touch, for example, the, the way you write on your phone, for example, is unique. OK, and it's a, it has very low intra-class variations and very high inter-class variations. This is challenge number one. Challenge number two is this behavioral biometrics, they provide you. I would not take it as a challenge, but you know, it's, it's always good. One time, these behavioral biometrics, they always provide you one shot login. One shot login means you need to be authenticated at the start of the session. You want to unlock your phone, you need to provide your biometric credential. That's it, at the start. Then this whole session, you are authenticated, right? You remain authenticated. For continuous authentication means even after you unlock your device correctly, but then continuously you are authenticated continuously without even letting you know. Okay, unless this, uh, unless this whole session finishes. When this is stops, authentication is not required. Different situations, applicability in different situations. Because these fingerprint face, they are static in nature. You could use them while running. You could use them while, you know, in, in the train, for example. These behaviors, they also need to be, we need to be sure that these behaviors remain constant across applications, no? So, now I'm presenting my paper. This is the work that I did uh, in a collaboration with, uh, with an agency of NATO, NIAS, Hold and Sign. Now, just looking at you, if you want, uh, for example, to test this app before we start, it would be nice. Or I just want to introduce you to, to this solution and then I want you to test it if you want, for example. It is good. As the name says, this is hold and sign. So it means you have to hold your phone, for example, like this, the way you hold your phone, and then you need to sign. Signing means writing your name, writing something that this phone knows, that you want to this phone to know, okay? So I call, this is a bimodal system. Do you know what bimodal system is? Two-vector authentication, exactly. So the motivation of using this uh, handwritten biometric recognition is, for example, uh, because it's widely used modality. We use this signature everywhere, you know. So the process of identifying the author of the given text. OK, is it your writing? Yes, right? So handwritten signature is a specific instance. 
wide social and legal acceptance in daily life. We used to sign contracts, we used to sign, you know, everything, and if we are accepting that, that system. Or indicate physical presence, for example, you need to sign when you enter this building, for example. This is the signature of Barack Obama. So the signature is also left somewhere on the internet. Handwritten biometric recognition systems, they are of two types. One, static biometric systems, they process the images offline. So, scared image is processed, you signature, you did the signature and this image of the signature is processed, okay? So, and compared with the stored image to authenticate and see the difference between them, right? And in dynamic systems, for example, signature is acquired by stylus, so you have a stylus or your fingerprint you could use, for example, this image is taken and this image is processed. And this authentication is performed in real time. So here in dynamic systems, the features are different. So you see spatial coordinates. For example, you have here a tablet. So the starting point and the ending point, they are different for, for every person. Then you have spatial coordinates in the y direction. Sorry, it was y here. Then you have, you apply different pressures, for example, based on your uh, age group, inclination angles, the way you write, for example. So this, uh, sig this signature systems, especially static systems, there are at least three companies working on this domain. So this is already a well-known modality. Now, what is different for me, for example, what is different is I am using you know, not fingerprint, uh, pressure, sorry. I'm using the way you are holding your phone, number one, as a modality. So when you hold your phone, actually the sensors inside it, they move, they record your movements in three directions, X, Y, and Z direction, okay? So the point is, in X, Y, in three-dimensional domain, it is very, very difficult uh, for, uh, like, it is very, very different from person to person this sample, this digital signature sample. So this is one modality, holding your phone. Other modality is writing your name. Okay, so for example, here, I have written here my name. Just, I want to share with you this. I'm pausing for like two, three minutes here. Could you please uh, test this system? Because this system is already trained on my samples. You have to write exactly that, for example. I'm telling you the algorithm, right? So you need to write this Buriro. I'm imitate, I'm using this as a mimic attack, for, you know, as a random attack, for example. So I forgot my phone, you found my phone, and you want to access my phone. So can you try five times? So how will you do this? You will write here, yes, please, please write. Bravo. Next. Not authenticated. Keep uh, uh, you know, trying five times and out of five, tell me how many times you were correctly misclassified. The whole thing is taking into account. Yeah, everything. So you need to also mimic your uh, Exactly, this is my point. I will talk about this in later. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, five times. Real time demo. Let's say like how many times I got spoofed. Complete. Not. No, not a single attempt got accepted. Yeah. Please, please. Okay. You can you need to click this test. Okay. And uh, write my name, yes? <laughs> they will it here. So, so for the first time, clear, yes. <laughs> next, first, next, uh, not, not authenticated, okay. Not authenticated, okay. Are you hard, hand right, uh, right or uh, left? <laughs> no. Right. Yeah, this is this is a random attack, so you are not supposed uh, to. Look. No, 
Maybe I will watch you like if I I will do this later. I will do this later. Pass, pass, pass it, please. Yeah, don't give it to Kevin because he has already tested. Okay. <laughs> this one. So, can I ask a question? Yeah, please, please. So, how do you decide the thresholds? Like, uh... I will talk. Okay. This is just the second slide of this. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Just a sec. Did you manage to get authenticated? No. 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 Okay, next. Yes. I'm excited to see results of Yanis. <laughs> <laughs> They are attacking my system, Barbara. They are attacking my system already. Yeah. <laughs> Press this test button, mock, and then you need to write this text. Okay. And press next. No. Five times, please. If you if you are trying to be slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so of course you need to write it in part. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I understood the position now. It's not that easy. It's very simple. I practiced with my mother's signatures when I was in high school. But I was uh, I know that there's <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. 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 How many times did you got accepted? No, no. no. Okay. Yeah, this is actually false acceptance. If any of your attempt is get, it gets accepted, it means it's a false acceptance. Yeah. Because the model is trained only on my samples. You got my point. In this context, apart from the image yes. itself, yeah. does it yes. also, yes. It, I believe it's real time, right? Yeah, it's real time. So it's also just like, also in right time, it's like, 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 Exactly. You were making me distracted before that, but I don't know this. But then it's also the decision of the problem. If I tried very fast, it didn't work. <laughs> if you're too fast. If you're too slow, it's also going to yeah. You have to mimic two invisible layers. <laughs> Even if like you are considering like the way you move, so exactly. this is one. Also the speed, exactly. everything, and the accuracy of there's also, I think there's also like inclination of which Exactly, exactly, everything. <laughs> I think uh, he is using a fake app for that operation. <laughs> no, very good observation. Very, very good observation. No, no, very good observation. I will do it in front of you. Maybe he is just collecting our signature. <laughs> also. Also. Oh, you're right. That's better. Okay, remember that I have there. So now you should be able to know what is a random attack. Someone sometimes forget his phone, forget his watch, for example, somewhere, and he. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. So just to, you know. To me, you have like the, the, the message not to get it for all, even though you should. For all of them. Even though you did it. <laughs> He's authenticated. Yeah. <laughs> so, you did it? Yeah. I, yeah, because <laughs> what are the trends on my? Sure, sure. Just want to see it with you. Sure. 
Look at the speed. He's Can I see the speed? He's yeah. yeah. part of the factors. Well, it's not the same. Yeah, but you it's are very slow. But it's still catching around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then it's catching your, uh, yeah. your face. You have been at it. No, actor. So now you are agree that no, this is not a fake, yeah. right? <laughs> okay, very good. Now the point is. It was different. It was different. <laughs> sure, sure. I'm, I'm talking about. It. Now the point is, you should read this. It is a bimodal system. What is it taking into account? Number one, touch points, not a signature image. It is taking into account the touch point passed while signing. So from a particular X point on X, Y coordinate and to the end, you know, it captures those touch points where you moved your finger. Number one, this is one modality. Second modality is phone. You have not seen me the training, how I train the system. Maybe I trained it in, in a standing position. And you all tried in sitting. Yeah. That's why I'm saying it's unique. Right? Now, now you have, we have simulated now the random attack. Now I'm signing in front of you. Yeah. And I, will, I can do it as many times as you would like. But still, you will, you won't be able to break it. Who accepts this challenge? I think you use like a fingerprint or something. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> just the process, just the right, the way of life. You want to see the source code. <laughs> yes, I want to see the source code. For sure. And the library you use. For sure, for sure. Why not? Java. Uh, sure, sure. We will. Now, challenge? The challenge will do now, exactly. Can, exactly I will, yeah, I will do. Like in front of you as many times as you would uh, you you would like to see, and then you have to mimic me. Okay. Right? Okay. You will keep sitting. No. We'll Come. <laughs> Just to be sure. Okay. So this test. The height. See. Is it possible to turn the camera see. on? Phone? Okay. Yeah. Maybe the uh, authenticated. So one the one. online guys can see there yeah. as well. Sorry. Just a second. Well, so you go there. No, this is false, you think? Okay. Okay. Yeah, we should. Do uh, yeah, yeah, if you can, so the online. Uh, it, this is the max that it goes. Down. I think we should go here. Yeah. yeah, how to do it online? No, no, I'm saying, can I can I can I can I take uh, No, this camera. I think. I think it's not really the time. Yeah, because it can go to the back and it can go to the back like this. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. It's not Maybe it's stand on the table oh. then. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. You are a good observer. Not okay. A few of them. One. We should use the same speed as he. Yes, uh, exactly. This is the point. Also the That's height. why I'm saying these are unique from person to person. Yeah. These are very, very specific. They, they depend on the size, on the height, on the arm length, everything. This is then similar to the keystrokes. Um, exactly. Everyone has a different typing exactly. speed. Exactly. And then it varies. Exactly. Forward. The same concept. No? no? You accept the challenge? Okay. I will share with you the source code. If, if anyone wants to work on this with me, I would love to. So this is a hold and sign biomodal system. You saw sign and the way you actually hold your phone. It's a bimodal system. And while having your phone in your hand, for example, they are different positions because of these differences in accelerometer, X, Y, Z, and gyroscopic X, Y, Z tuples, you are, you are not authentic. So the claim here is we don't need any extra. Yes, please. Question based on yes. Yes. the please. Yeah. So if you train the model, let's say for instance while standing, does it mean when you want to unlock, you also have to be standing? Okay, very good question. 
I, I would talk this uh, anyway, I will tell you this. But the point is, this is a very, very good question. So will this mechanism is usable across multiple activities? This is your question, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, provided that you train this system in multiple positions. So the main claim is this system doesn't require any additional specific hardware, right? So the accelerometer and gyroscope, they are sufficient. And we use existing hardware technology. The data collection for this paper, you could read this paper, it's already published. We managed to attract 30 users for this study, and we collected 30 samples in each activity, sitting, standing, and in walking. Walking in the corridor, you know, in the controlled environment. Now, participants were like 22 male, all of them, they were master's students or PhD students, and we used Google Nexus 5 for data collection. So, anomaly detection. Anyone who has background of machine learning? Very good. So, one class classification and binary class classification, what is the difference? Can I model this smartphone authentication problem as a binary class or multi-class classification problem? Can I model this? Yes. Why? Would you like to share your samples with me so that I train my model here as well on your samples? No, it's a, no, <laughs> it's a privacy concern. So for specifically for smartphones, for, for example, smartphone authentication, smartwatch authentication, this problem is one class classification problem. What is the difference between one class classification and binary class classification? Anyone? What is the difference? Between? So for binary class classification, you need to have the data, the training data for at least two classes. Right to train the model for one class or this anomaly detection approach, you have the data from a positive class and you have to train your system only on that class. So this approach is more usable and more realistic. I mean, from smartwatch user authentication scenario. Now, for example, so we, we used these four classifiers initially. We used KNES neighbor and multilayer perceptron base net and random forest as initial because they were found very useful in the recent studies to so use them. And with initial experiments, for example, this MLP classifier, this is called artificial neural network, you call it or you call it multilayer perceptron. It worked very, very well. And we were able to get 79% true accept rate. What is this true accept rate? It means how many times it authenticated me correctly, me correctly. Training on my data and testing on my data. And FAR was just 0.1%. So this is already a very, very good result. But the question is, users would not be, should not be buying this solution because they would say every fifth attempt is strongly rejected. Right? False accept rate is very, very nice. So every one out of 100 attempts will get accepted. This is a very, very good result. But from the Reject from the usability perspective, user would say, no, rejected every fifth attempt is not a solution. I would not buy it. So what we did, for example, we thought that probably, you know, features are redundant. The features are not useful, for example. Let's get rid of those non, you know, productive features and see how much accuracy increases. So we applied this recursive feature elimination method. We applied other techniques as well, but none of them worked well. This RFE method, it worked well. On the training data only, we applied secret learn with tenfold cross validation. You see for sitting, standing and walking, here, for example, with just 10 or 11 features, we already received the highest accuracy. So these 10, 11 and 11 features from these different standing, sitting and walking postures, we took them and we trained the classifiers on them. So the result says, for example, interactivity. So this is across different applications, different activities, sitting, standing, walking. And here you see, for example, on the full features and on the recursive feature elimination features. 
So you see, this, these are intra-class. Okay, so it means, for example, in sitting, if you train the model in sitting and tested it on standing and, uh, you know, uh, walking, the result would be worst. For full features, especially, they were worst. For recursive feature elimination method, at least we were reaching 60%. For standing also, exactly like this, right? So what was the idea? Idea was, was to fuse these modalities, these postures, for example. So sitting, standing, and walking, train, introduce a combined training system where you have, you use fused methodology, for example, for this, and then you test the system. So with this approach, for example, we reach this 94.8% true accept rate. So this false reject rate is just one minus this. So 5.2 false accept rate from 0 0.1, it, it, it increased to 3.1, which is also acceptable. And 69.9%, 96.9% was the true reject. So these are very, very good results. So now, for example, we, we were sure that these results can be sold. Apart from this, what we, what other thing we did, for example, we compared our technique, this technique, for example, with other existing state of the art. So, you know, entering four digit pin, how long do you take? On average, three seconds. Yes, you could be fast, three seconds, yes. So from like up to four seconds, right? Here, 3.7 is the average. Very good. So the point is, you know, three to four seconds is very, very common. For biometric modality wise, for example, it's 5.15 seconds. So we compared with this sample acquisition time as well. How long a user has to, you know, provide the same maximum time. Hold and sign, you know, was the best one, which on average with just 3.5 seconds of data. Then, for example, we tested uh, we, we compare them on the basis of uh, testing time as well. How? Because this application is meant for the phone and you have seen the results on the phone. It means how long this classifier takes to, to decide whether you are Guriro or not Guriro. Decision time. So this decision time on average based on 30 users, it was between this 0 0.215 you know, seconds to 0 0.256. Very, very quick because of this MLP classifier. Then we also checked the performance comparison, okay, in terms of power, for example. So we applied a standard methodology that is already used in the literature. We use the same methodology and we used this triple, you know, profile to, 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 to profile this power during the process. And, you know, actually for the 35 attempts, it was consuming approximately what what this way. And you know, if you compare it with one minute of phone call, it is lower. So it's a power friendly system. For one minute of call, you know, 1054 milliwatts are burnt. Then from usability perspective, we say if you are if you don't want to provide more samples for training, if you are happy with providing just 15 samples, just 15, okay, then for 3.5 seconds of data, you, you take maximum 65 seconds to provide me 15 samples. And with this data, with this data size, 15 samples of data, you are already reaching like up to 65, 66% accuracy, true acceptance rate. This is true acceptance rate. And with 45 samples, this model is now trained on 45 samples. So with 45 samples, you take like four minutes to train this system, right? And with four minutes of your effort, if it is giving you 93.4% accuracy, it would be good. So usability is also important for us and other parameters are also. Last thing that the, 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 the participants who participated to this experiments, we did this uh, usability experiment as well. So this usability standard is called SUS, Software Usability Scale. And we asked users, for example, to rate our application. So it, it is a 10 questions based questionnaire where, where you ask users, for example, about their experience with the system. And we got this 
68.3 percent score, which means 72 percent is considered good. So a bit lower than the the, the good, but it's I mean it was it, they were initial results, so it should be okay. Right? Any questions? So open issues that uh, we are interested to you know to. To, to solve, for example, number of testers, because here the number of testers are just 30. You know, in order to draw a concrete conclusion, for example, 30 users are a bit limited. No? So idea is to extend this number of users, for example, if we could 200, 1000, for example, and run these tests, not just in the controlled environment, in the void. You are on the mountain, you need to be authenticated. You are in the sea, for example, you are on the beach. So different contexts, different environments, different locations, the system should be resilient. Training time without compromising too much security. Training time is very, very important because this classifier based on different number of samples takes some time. Also, this is, a, although this is just a one-time effort for the classifier on the, on the phone, but it's still, it takes some time. Unplanned situations, sometimes you need to run, sometimes you need to, uh, you need to face emergency situations, for example, where you need to call someone, you know, so it should cover also those unplanned situations as well. Robustness to multiple attacks. So here we tested this mimic attack and this random attacks. And uh, trust me, none of the attempt also with those 30 users got accepted. So which proves that the system is very, very good. And variability depending on iOS, this is this needs to be see, because we tested it only on you know this uh, because we collected the data only on uh, uh, on Google Nexus 5. But now it's the latest phone, and I, I don't see any difference. So I mean, it should be it should not be a vendor specific solution. It should be a general solution. Any more question? I would love to see if someone of you tries to test train, for example, by himself and test by himself. You can try. 